It is a wonderful honor to welcome Professor Stephen Hicks. He teaches philosophy at Rockford University, and today we're discussing his um, very important and, I'd say, thought-provoking book, Nietzsche and the Nazis, A Personal View. Stephen, welcome to the show. How are you? Hey, thanks, Chung, for the invitation. Yeah, so um, I'd say this book of yours is quite uh, popular. I think it, this is the first book which I was introduced to you and your work uh, from. Um, and of course, the the title itself, as well as the contents, uh, sparked some very controversial thinking. Now, I'd like to begin by asking you, um, why is Nietzsche so influential? Well, uh, I think I think two things. I think one is that he is a he is in fact a brilliant philosopher, by which I mean he uh, goes to the fundamental issues. Uh, most provocatively in ethical issues in the history of ethics. But uh, in taking those up, he uh, is taking up what it is to be a human being, what the nature of knowledge is, what uh, we should take reality to be, addressing all of the issues about free will, determinism, and then the implications of all of that for not only one's personal psychology and personal value quest, but also social psychology. So he uh, uh, is up to speed on what all of the important issues are. Uh, and he takes all of them up and has not always original things to say, although many, many original things, but nonetheless, the package that he puts together is uh, in many cases original, but it's always insightful and as an integrate, uh, it's one of those uh, uh, systems of thought or sets of ideas that really any thinking individual is going to come across and find themselves grappling with after Nietzsche. Mm -hmm. Yes. And of course, it helps, too, that he was a brilliant writer. Yes, absolutely. And uh, <laughs> not uh, just to poke a little bit of fun at the Germans, uh, mm -hmm. he's an unusually excellent stylist for... German writers. Obviously, there are uh, several who do, but German uh, ph philosophical writers have a deserved reputation for being rather clunky <laughs> and uh, difficult to read. Nietzsche is a, an outlier in that sense. <laughs> yes. Um, so you're also an expert in uh, postmodernism. So to what extent is postmodernism influenced by uh, Friedrich Nietzsche? I think uh, significantly so. Uh, Nietzsche does, uh, in the late 1800s, capture many of the, you know, very broadly, we'll use these terms uh, generally right now, but skeptical, uh, subjectivistic, and therefore relativistic themes, uh, sounding then themes of per perspectivalism, which is uh, one of Nietzsche's uh, terms for this, but underlying the perspectivalism is a combination of that with a skepticism that we cannot get past subjective perspectives. And so therefore, what we call truth needs to start being put in quotation marks. Uh, we do need to uh, relativize not only one's uh, more just straightforward understanding of what the facts are. Nietzsche becomes skeptical that there are such things as facts, but then certainly uh, more significantly and more provocatively when we come to value statements, uh, Nietzsche is then a fundamental rejection of the idea that had been quite widespread in uh, most philosophical traditions that there were eternal or absolute or universal or intrinsic moral truths uh, and so this is fundamentally rejected by, by Nietzsche. Now, then the question is, if we take that approach to uh, uh, knowledge, the skeptical, relativized, subjective approach, and we do the same thing for values, then we are significantly on the way to postmodernism, because postmodernism is, is going to take up those themes and become, I think, more uh, more ruthless on them than Nietzsche Nietzsche was. Uh, Nietzsche, uh, to a significant extent, is still trying to do metaphysics. He's still saying there is a reality out there, and that uh, through various ways, not necessarily rational ways, but by 
channeling our deepest instincts and letting them, in some sense, speak to us, we can uh, get a sense for what real reality is like. And so he does have a, a power metaphysics or a power ontology uh, and a certain view about uh, everything being determined and fatalistically governed in the world. So that metaphysics uh, is still in Nietzsche. That's one of the things that the postmoderns are going to jettison. So they will become, kind of, uh, the, the technical term here is anti-realist to say that we just can't talk about what, uh, what a reality actually is. Um, we can go uh, further down in uh, on any of those issues, but uh, probably one indicator of the connection of postmoderns uh, uh, who come on board in the 1950s, the 1960s, Foucault, Derrida, Lyotard, and the others are in graduate school uh, and finishing up graduate school in the 1950s, but making their mark on the philosophy profession in the 1960s. So they are uh, already uh, 60 years after Nietzsche has died. So we are talking about two generations later, but uh, Michel Foucault, who's probably the most famous and influential of all of the postmoderns, at one point in a, a later interview uh, said quite straightforwardly, he said, this is a direct quote, I am simply a Nietzschean, uh, uh, end quote. And then he goes on to say that all he is doing in his work or the best way to read his work is that he is taking Nietzschean themes and Nietzschean methodology and applying it to texts and uh, his historical studies or, or genealogy as, uh, as he calls it. So, I think uh, teasing out uh, uh, the, the foundation that Nietzsche laid is a significant amount of what you find in the foundational views of the postmoderns. Now, the postmoderns are also incorporating, most of them, non-Nietzschean social and political philosophy. Most of them, at least in the first generation, are coming out of the far left, so they're much more influenced by Karl Marx and various forms of neo-Marxism uh, and, and how that it all gets to put together is another story. But Nietzsche is fundamental to, uh, to, uh, to the postmoderns. Maybe one other thing I would say just on this genealogy part or intellectual history point is uh, between the first generation postmoderns of the late 50s and 1960s uh, and Nietzsche, who died in 1900, uh, is Martin Heidegger. And basically all of the postmoderns are deeply versed in Heidegger's philosophy as well. And Heidegger is deeply influenced and deeply immersed in Nietzschean philosophy. So some of the postmoderns will take from Nietzsche filtered through Heidegger. And then, then teasing out the different threads and subversions is uh, an interesting exercise. But the question is absolutely yes. From Nietzsche to the postmodern, some strong connections. <laughs> so uh, your short book, Nietzsche and the Nazis, argued that uh, the ideas of Friedrich Nietzsche are uh, filtered through and in large part influence Nazism. Um, so to what extent can you see the influence of Nietzsche in our contemporary politics? Uh, contemporary politics being 2024. I'd say so, yeah, and the last yes. five years in general, I suppose. Oh, right. well, that's a that's a big question. That's a hard question. Uh, I would say one element would be if you then take the postmoderns who are developing their ideas in the 60s and then becoming more institutionalized in the 70s and 1980s. And then you start to see postmodernism uh, applied in the various professional disciplines like education and nursing and journalism uh, and, uh, and the rise of uh, uh, kind of postmodern legal theories in the 90s and on into the 2000s. Then you have a, a progression from very high philosophical theory through the academy more generally, then into applied disciplines and then spilling out more significantly into the culture. Uh, and we start to see that in 2015, certainly by 2018, before, before, uh, before COVID. Now, the terminology, though, is that nobody's calling it postmodernism at that point. Instead, there are various 
uh, subversions of postmodernism and postmodernism integrated with critical theory, which has some overlapping, but also some distinct line lineages. Uh, 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 and so what we have is a number of movements, activist movements, but using a set of more general ideological themes that are identifiably critical theorist or postmodern being applied, but they are uh, then typically being called, you know, like critical race theory, for example, or wokeism, or various strands of feminism, or various forms of uh, uh, deep ecology in some form. So they are uh, guided by very general principles, but they are much more very specific issue focused. One place you can see it, I think, is also uh, in journalism, where uh, you find more explicitly journalists and journalism professors saying that objectivity and the, the, the issue of neutrality, presenting both sides of the case, or just presenting the facts so that readers can make their own mind up, or if one wants to argue something, say, in an editorial or to write a persuasive piece of journalism, nonetheless, to make it clear that you are uh, upholding standards of journalism, doing investigative journalism, trying to get your facts straight and presenting those, you see a significant demographic within journalism rejecting all of that traditional approach to journalism and explicitly being more activist. Uh, and that's an important cultural shift that postmodernism feeds into significantly. Um, uh, I don't want to talk about uh, contemporary politics. We're in, uh, in, a, in a, uh, an unfortunate election season here in the United States. Uh, but I would also say that the, the way in which we are doing politics publicly for the last eight years or so, where issues of character and truth uh, are, are, are taking an even further back seat than has become normal in the, the debasement of political discussion in a democratic republics for the last century or so. I think we've taken another step downward. And uh, some of that uh, is certainly attributable, attributable rather to uh, postmodernism and its uh, debasement of uh, epistemological and cognitive standards in doing politics. Mm -hmm. I see. Now I've tackled uh topic of uh, the woke movement uh, multiple times mm -hmm. in the show um, from an against perspective most of the time. Mm. Um, now, why do you believe that um, Nietzsche is seething contempt for the weak and idolatry of strength and vigor um, can be compatible with uh, the woke movement's um, purported advocacy for uh, the weak and the marginalized? Yeah. Yeah, that's an interesting question. So in Nietzsche, he, he ultimately has a power ontology. So uh, what we call you know, justice and truth are simply rhetorical strategies that we use to advance our power agendas, rather than saying that first we figure out what the truth is, and then we devote our power to advancing the truth, or we figure out what's just, and we use our power to advance the just. So that inversion is important. And then, uh, so if you have a power ontology, then the next obvious thing is to say is that obviously power is not equally distributed among human beings. Some people are smarter, some people are stupider, some people are more physically powerful, more physically vital, some people are less so. Some people have more courage, some people are more cowardly. So in almost any dimension of human activity that's important to you, you can uh, you know, specify that dimension and send, say people are stronger or weaker along that dimension. Then I think it becomes an issue of where your sympathies are. And staying within a Nietzschean framework, it has to be a, a sympathy approach. You're not going to say that one should objectively say that these ones are better and these ones are worse, or that we ought to do this, that, or the other thing, because all of that is on Nietzschean grounds simply going to be an expression of what your underlying kind of psychological and biological state is. So uh, a pure Nietzschean, I think, then would say, I, Nietzsche, or I, Nietzschean, 
recognize that everything is just power, that power is unequally distributed, but I identify with, and that's one connection, that language there, or I feel more strongly uh, attuned to people who are here. So maybe my th th thing is that when I see people who are strong and intelligent and powerful and vigorous, something in me thrills to that. I get excited and I get inspired and I want to be like that kind of person. Now, I'm not going to say that I am objectively the right kind of human being, but rather that's the kind of human being that I am. And then I think a pure Nietzschean then at the same point in time would say there are going to be other people who would say, yes, power ontology is true. Everything is power. Uh, and there is a, are these distributions of uh, power, some people stronger, some people weaker on all of these various dimensions. But when I see those strong, intelligent, powerful people, they scare me. They frighten me. I don't I don't like them. And when I see people who are weak, who are suffering, who are on the receiving end of various bad things happening in the world, I feel for them. I resonate with them. Uh, and I wish that I could do something for them. And again, as a Nietzschean, I would not say that my position is objectively true or should be universalized, but that's just the kind of person I am. So I think a Nietzschean explanation of the woke would be to say that we Nietzscheans agree on the power ontology, we agree on the distribution of assets or distributions of power, that everything is unequal, but we are biologically and psychologically constituted differently, such that the woke resonate with and identify with the weak, whereas I uh, uh, the historical Nietzsche identify with the powerful and the strong. So no disagreements, so to speak, on the fundamentals, but then an, an affective dif difference. So Nietzsche would then uh, you know, use the kinds of analogies that he is famous for using, for saying if we look more broadly at the animal kingdom, the animal kingdom divides into more predator types and more prey types of beings. And the prey types, they are typically herd animals. They're more fearful. They stay together. They don't stick their necks out. They're scared of the predators. And that's just how they are. And then by contrast, there are predator animals that are wired biologically. And therefore, their psychology is an expression of a predatory biology. And they are typically more alone, willing to go off and do their own thing. They enjoy conflict. They're not afraid of conflict. They feel contempt for the weak. And this picks up another part of the, the question that, uh, that, that launched this, uh, this, this discovery. Where they, they, uh, they look at the weak and they say, either I would like to dominate them or I would like to eat, uh, eat them. They look tasty to me, but I certainly would not want to be like them. That's, that's beneath my dignity as a wolf or as a lion to think that I could ever have anything in common and would want to be like them. So to draw the analogy then, he, uh, Nietzsche wants to say that human beings come out of the same long line of evolutionary biology and uh, that the distinction between predator types and prey types is also represented within the human being. So some of us have evolved to be more prey-like, prey uh, sheep-like, herd animal-like, and others have evolved, the, the small minority, to be more predator-like, to be more lion-like, to be more wolf-like. And uh, then just to come full thread, uh, given that psychology, right, manifesting the biology that he thinks is more fundamental, there's no way that the prey and the predators are really going to speak the same language, be able to understand each other, have the same value framework, and get along with each other. It is simply going to be a battle for dominance, each using its own survival strategies to survive and advance its agenda, whatever that happens to be. So on to Nazism. Um, what are some of the ways in which um, Nazism is still commonly misunderstood. Mm. Well, 
I think here of my own intellectual journey back when I was a, a teenager and uh, reading things. And I started, first started learning about the Nazis and the Holocaust, and they just seemed like crazy, crazy guys to me. And I couldn't believe uh, that there were people like that. You know, I'd grown up in uh, Canada as a uh, you know, you know, peaceful, tolerant, uh, multicultural country and and so forth. So the uh, uh, the not only the content of uh, Nazi philosophy and ideas, but also their practice just seemed uh, 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 alien to me. So it wasn't until I started reading more seriously, uh, not just the general histories, um, and here my philosophy training uh, was important because as an undergraduate, you're reading all of these different philosophers and they all disagree with each other. And you understand their arguments and part of your philosophical training is to try to get inside the philosophical framework of whatever philosopher you are reading to see them from the inside. So I was reading uh, you know, many of the philosophers like Nietzsche, for example, for the first time, and Karl Marx and, and, and George Hegel and various others. Uh, and, and trying to read them sympathetically. And then, of course, having done so, then step out to which of these, what, you know, what elements of these things do I think are true or false? And how do I argue in formulating my own views and so on? At the same time, I was uh, still reading uh, uh, political history and intellectual history. Uh, you know, I became interested in World War II and World War I uh, and trying to figure out why these terrible wars had occurred, uh, and then starting to read some Japanese history and history of Italy and Germany and so on. And at that point, uh, you're know, reading what uh, Hitler himself had said, particularly in the 1920s before he came to power, and reading what Joseph Goebbels had said, uh, not only his speeches, but some of his earlier novelistic writings and uh, other uh, articles that he had written in uh, you know often ideological pieces and so forth but laying out his laying out his thinking and i started to realize that you know however much i disagree with these guys nonetheless they have uh ideas uh it's not just that they want power and they have ideas and that those ideas uh have an, at least an internal consistency uh, and many of those ideas are normative ideas where they are saying these things are true and important and good. Uh, and so they're using the language of good and evil. But the way that Hitler and Goebbels and the others in the 1920s, before they come to power, are writing is that they are writing in a way that uh, uh, shows that they have read the more academic and more public intellectual big brains in Germany and other places uh, of their generation. Uh, and then, so I started to, uh, to realize that they were not just kind of uneducated people, but rather they, they were thoughtful people. And then you, know, you read that Goebbels had a PhD, uh, that he had attended you know, like five different universities, and he could quote accurately all sorts of you know, uh, economic writers and political writers and philosophers and poets and historians and so forth. And that uh, Hitler also was an, a, a, a reader always reading and also could quote, uh, in many cases, properly uh, important philosophers and, and earlier thinkers and so on. So getting past the idea that these are just crazy guys or guys who are just uh, uh, superficially using ideas, that there is in fact uh, an ideology there and behind the ideology, there are deep thinkers. And then the next stage was for me to start reading what I think of as the intermediate thinkers. So um, I had read Nietzsche at this point. I had read Martin Heidegger. You know, Martin Heidegger, by pretty much everyone's estimation, is the, the most brilliant of the German philosophers of his generation already in the 1920s. And he joins the Nazi party and becomes an enthusiastic advocate for him. And then you start to then see uh, that not only the first great philosophers like Nietzsche and behind him Hegel, but also Heidegger of that generation have ideas 
that accurately can be seen as part of the National Socialist program, but also that the intermediate thinkers, as I think of them, the people between the political activists like Hitler, Goebbels, and the others, and the deep philosophers like Heidegger and Nietzsche, stand people like Oswald Spengler, who was also a PhD and wrote an, a public intellectual bestseller, or Moeller Vandenbroek, who in the early 1930s, another PhD, wrote a public intellectual bestseller calling, calling his book The Third Reich. And this is 10 years before the Nazis come to power. So I became more alert to how the deepest philosophers of the 19th century, and here I would include Hegel, um, certainly Marx to some extent, uh, Nietzsche, uh, but then how they are taken by the PhD holding public intellectuals of the late 19 teens and 20s, like Oswald Spengler and Moeller Vandenbroek, and then picked up by someone like Martin Heidegger, and from them to Joseph Goebbels and Hitler. So there was a philosophical program at work. Another part of it that was very important to me was realizing that there were all sorts of uh, uh, high powered German intellectuals and, and in other nations as well, who were uh, not stupid people. These were PhDs and people who had won Nobel prizes in physics and in literature, who and you might then say, well, OK, they're not philosophers and they don't know economics and they haven't read political history deeply and so forth. Maybe they are more likely to be bamboozled. But nonetheless, these are extraordinarily intelligent people who know uh, and can talk the talk about what the Nazis are standing for. And they are agreeing with the Nazis for those principles. So starting to see it as an intellectually deep movement, however much I disagreed with it. Was, was crucially important. Now, the other part of it is that the Nazis in the 1920s are operating in a republic. It's the Weimar Republic, and it has significant democratic institutions as well. And if they're going to be successful in that regime, then that means that they have to get lots of votes. Uh, they have to play the parliamentary politics game, and they have to play within the Republican and democratic institutional rules. And so there's a huge then amount of party politicking that goes on and a huge amount of what goes on in the mass newspapers and putting rallies together, using the modern tools of, of, of technology uh, you know, and, and the mass printing of pamphlets, using the early radio uh, uh, and, and filming the speeches and having those speeches spread. So they also are doing uh, very serious uh, politicking in inside that framework in order to attract the masses. And so there you might say, well, you know, maybe the intellectual component doesn't matter so much. But it is, I think, also important there to say that the Germans in the 1920s were not stupid people, that arguably the Germans were the highest educated people in the world. And when you look at uh, newspaper readership in the 1920s and the number of people listening to radio, not just for music, but for news and for commentary, uh, the, the Germans are the highest in the world, They're the highest uh, literacy rates in the world. And uh, when you start looking at some of the professions like uh, teachers, and you start to realize that here are teachers who at least have a you know, good solid education and they now and then get a teaching position at a German school. That says something about your accomplishment that uh, uh, the, the, the highest professional demographic represented in National Socialist Party membership was school teachers. So these were not uh, dumb, uneducated people who were being bamboozled. There was a serious intellectual program at work. So that became a very interesting project, and all of that is the background to why uh, I came to write the book. <laughs> yes, and to my embarrassment, I, I used to believe that um, Nazism is either anti-intellectual or appeal to those of uh, lower intellect. So um, hmm. uh, I think well, of, I was uh, I was with you. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so it, it is hard to and and the, and I would say it's it's also true that as part of their populist program, 
the Nazis did find a way to take their general message and make it appealing to unintellectual people and more brutal people as well. <laughs> yes. So what is it about the <clears throat> the Nazi program that appeals to high minds like Heidegger and I would add Carl Schmitt as well, amongst others? Uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, mentioning Carl Schmitt, absolutely important here. Another brilliant, brilliant mind. And to pick up on your earlier question about the relevance of all of this now, I mean, Carl Schmitt is, uh, uh, even though he was a, a card-carrying uh, National Socialist Party member uh, uh, and, and responsible for much of its innovations with respect to constitutional law, uh, um, Schmidt is now beloved and widely read among uh, people on the left, uh, you know, putting that in quotations, but the very far left uh, and many of the postmoderns even though traditionally we would say that Schmidt as a Nazi, according to their understanding of the political spectrum is on the, the far right. So Schmidt is one of those thinkers who uh, is deeply appealing to intellectuals uh, who are, so again, scare quotes, extremist far left and far right people of our, of our, of our generation. Uh, so to try to make sense of what makes it seem like an ideal but one thing you can do is you can say, look, we accept some sort of power ontology. We might say that ultimately everything just comes down to power. Uh, and we want to have power. We want to have power for our people, our group. We want to make our group great. Uh, and that's the ideal, uh, is not to be a weakling and not to have your group uh, be beaten up on by the other groups out there. That's just too ethnically embarrassing or racially embarrassing or nationalistically embarrassing right, or what. And we do know that uh, a significant number of people psychologically, that is their ideal. They identify with their race. They identify with their ethnicity. They identify with their power. They get worked up by that. And whatever is good for that group is, is what they are, are they're going to go for. But there's another level to this that uh, most of the uh, uh, national socialist philosophers would want to say it's not simply a power politics or a low grade nationalism or ethnic focus that we are talking about, that we are drawing on centuries of a certain moral tradition that had said you should not be um, an individualistic person. You should not be a self-interested person and talking about your rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That we think morally that that British uh, liberalism and American Declaration of Independence, those ideals are in fact terrible, low-grade ideals because they are egoistic, they are self-interested, they're eudaimonistic, they're all about pursuing your inclinations. And what we and then uh, in this context, if we Germans especially have learned from Immanuel Kant, from Fichte, from Hegel on down, is that a moral person does not think about his self-interest. He thinks about his duty. He thinks about being obedient and serving a cause beyond himself and is willing to sacrifice himself for that noble cause. Now that moral tradition uh, that was deep in much of German philosophy, the National Socialists, I do think they were, uh, when they were young men, most of them, true believers, that they thought that they were following in Kant and Fichte and Hegel's footsteps. So it wasn't just power politics. Of course, they wanted to power and they wanted to make Germany great, but they thought that the ideal of being willing to sacrifice yourself for some higher cause and not thinking about yourself was the most noble thing an individual could do. So from their perspective, it's power versus this idea of freedom and capitalism that they see as decadent in Britain, America, and so forth. It's, it's, it's power that is the truth, but it's also that they are moral idealists in the sense that they reject the idealism of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness and are pursuing the ideal of a more selfless sacrifice for a higher cause. 
And so to the extent that they believe that that's an ideal and that when they present that to a large number of people, you should be willing to sacrifice yourself for others, for the nation, for the good of your people. Um, that is the higher calling. They found a, a ready uh, mass <laughs> movement as well of people who wanted to say, yes, I want to serve something beyond myself, be, 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 uh, be, uh, be willing to sacrifice myself for something greater than myself. So that uh, is a kind of idealism, which is then to say that if we are interested in confronting the Nazis intellectually, it's not only their political program, it's also their ethical program that needs to be highlighted and, uh, uh, and, and, uh, and discussed. Also then from their perspective, um, uh, if you think that, and this is a, an important part of it, the religious tradition is important here because we know that the Nazis were singling out Jews and a little bit more broadly Semitic types of people for being a lower order of people, that there is a long history in the West of religious rivalries. And partly it is, there's my religious group and there's your religious group and we hate each other and we will do various nasty things to uh, be intolerant and persecute and even kill as many people of the other religious group because they are alien and they are bad. But at the same time, internal to that religious tradition it has been a strong notion of the, to be a moral person, you need to obey higher authority. You should be selfless. You should be willing to sacrifice yourself for the good of others, the good of your cause. So if you have an alien group that you are in a power struggle with, that's the political component, and you internally think that a moral person is selflessly sacrificing for your cause, then religiously, and the significant number of religious people inside Germany in the early part of the 20th century, they are also then going to be attracted to a political cause that asks them to be obedient and be willing to sacrifice themselves for some, some higher cause. Um, now here I'm obviously singling out uh, uh, the Christianity and the Christianity's long history of rivalry and in many cases persecution of Jews. And there were a significant number of Christians who saw their moral program as fitting with the Nazi moral program. Now, to be fair, there are lots of other forms of Christianity that emphasize different themes within Christianity and therefore were opposed to the Nazis, but there was a significant Venn diagram overlap as a, as a, uh, a part of it. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, being opposed to the Jews, being willing to sacrifice, being willing to serve some group beyond yourself, the Nazis uh, uh, made significant uh, um, mileage, so to speak, out of that. Yes. And of course, we, we know now that Nietzsche is very contemptuous of Christian morals. And uh, yes. the Judaic uh, ethical roots that uh, preceded it. So, right. Now, this is one of the ways that, in which Nietzsche and the Nazis differ from each other. <laughs> uh, from Nietzsche's perspective, Christianity is uh, continuous with Judaism. It's, uh, he sees it as a kind of a reform movement and a purification of something that's deep inside of Judaism. Whereas for the Nazis, they are, uh, you know, they recognize the historical differences, but they want to argue that fundamentally Judaism and Christianity are opposite to each other. So they're trying to uh, distance themselves as much as possible. <laughs> yes. Um, so was Nietzsche, what was Nietzsche's attitude towards uh, the Jews? Uh, mixed. I uh, I think of him as a kind of a low-grade anti-Semite. So uh, that is to say, I think he had some of the stereotypical views of Jews, and he was philosophically contemptuous of the philosophy and the moral uh, theory that Judaism represents. So there's philosophical opposition to the Jews. Uh, but in the case of Nietzsche, I think he also had some, uh, if, if you think of the Jews as a culture with their manner of dress and speaking and so forth, that he felt them as being uh, kind of un-German or un-Germanic, uh, and maybe even un-European in a way that he preferred. 
So he would have had not only a philosophical opposition to them, but also kind of a cultural and psychological uh, sense of alienation. And that comes up in him uh, at various points. But I say a low-grade anti-Semitism because sprinkled throughout uh, Nietzsche's writings, you find in many cases where Nietzsche is uh, admiring of the Jews and praises the Jews. So he does think, for example, that of all of the different ethnicities and all of the different religions operative in Europe in the 1800s, his, his contemporary times, he does think that the Jews are the most intelligent uh, that they're 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 a lot smarter than contemporary Germans, a lot smarter than uh, any other ethnic or religious group, and he thinks that intelligence is a kind of power, and the fact that the Jews have been able to cultivate this very powerful intelligence, he thinks is to their credit, and so he sees them in that sense as as admirable and as a as a worthy foe. He also recognizes that uh, the Jews, despite uh, the terrible persecution that they have endured pretty much everywhere for thousands of years, that nonetheless, they have been able to survive, to keep their cultural identity together, to keep their religious identity together, uh, so to speak, the worst that anybody has thrown at them. And nonetheless, they survive. There is there is an internal vitality to Judaism. And Nietzsche, as someone who says, you have to admire any survival strategy that works in this brutal power play world that works. And the Jews have done it for longer than anybody else ever has. That's to their credit. So there is a kind of admiration that pops out in Nietzsche frequently uh, 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 for the Jews. So that's why I say he's not a, a, a strong anti-Semite in ways that are much more common in Germany at the time. Of course, uh, Nietzsche also had a sort of love-hate relationship with uh, Ricoch Wagner, who in, in many more degrees was a much bigger anti-Semite than, than Nietzsche. Um, yes. I, I wonder, what did Nietzsche see in, in Wagner that he finds appealing? Yeah, this, I think, takes us into uh, uh, musicality, and uh, we'd have to talk some about the philosophy of music. Uh, some, but I, I think the short answer is to say that in the early Wagner, Nietzsche recognizes someone who has a genius, right? and, and, and clearly uh, Wagner is a musical genius. The, the scope of his uh, themes, his orchestration, his originality, and all of those things, Nietzsche recognizes, just as most people who know music will recognize, even if they don't like the music, as as a, 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 a genius level. When we get into things that are harder, we start talking about the themes that are in music. When Wagner was serious as in, early in trying to uh, incorporate themes coming out of say Norse mythology and going very deep, very metaphysical uh, uh, into what we can take these, uh, these old myths and find a kernel of e something eternal and massively significant uh, such that I can translate that into a musical motif in a way that communicates to you, not only emotionally, the way music does, but also intellectually, that it makes you think about deep and important metaphysical things, uh, that, that, that Wagner is extremely important. And the fact that at that point, He's not uh, 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 doing low-grade pop music. He's not doing band hall music. He's not doing uh, uh, things that are, are easily accessible. These are uh, uh, musical themes and motifs that require that uh, one become a cultivated person to live up to the music. And so Nietzsche recognizes that and responds to that. Uh, and then I think also Nietzsche was younger, and so he is looking at that point desperately for older people who can be kind of mentors or at least heroes to look up to because he's not seeing very many of those. And, uh, and people who have a hero-worshipping philosophy like Nietzsche does, they want them not to merely be platonic forms. They want real heroes to look up to. So I think uh, that all of that explains why Nietzsche was so strongly, positively responsive to Wagner early on. 
Then I think, uh, uh, again, trying to keep this short, uh, Nietzsche sees a turn in the later Wagner. I think he, he sees that turn in a direction of a kind of cowardice or a kind of, of weakening, where uh, instead of the strong, stern, ultimately fatalistic Norse, if we might say, uh, uh, themes in the early music, you start to see Christian themes about forgiveness and kinds of redemption and a, and a certain kind of softness or a longing for something that at least to Nietzsche's ear sounds like a turning away from that strong, forceful, deep theme to a, a, a psychologically weaker uh, form. And so Wagner's genius then is perverted into this metaphysically and morally objectionable Christian uh, thematic universe, and Nietzsche finds that unforgivable. I believe um, Nietzsche uh, used to say that I would never forgive Christianity for what it did to Pascal. What, <laughs> what, <clears throat> so what, in Nietzsche's view, did Christianity do to Pascal? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know specifically. I, uh, I I've read some Pascal, and I enjoy teaching uh, Pascal's Wager uh, when I do courses in philosophy of uh, of religion. Beyond that, I don't know. Pascal was a brilliant mathematician as well, so uh, I can only speculate. But I do know that Pascal did combine kind of a a rational mathematical brilliance with a deeply fideistic, anti rational. Uh, 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 form of Christianity. So I think uh, if uh, Nietzsche thinks that Pascal had potential to be something more than he was had he not been born in a Christian environment, uh, that's probably what the the criticism is, but I'm speculating. So how did the Nazis uh, appropriate old Nord Smiths to their political advantage? Yeah, uh, again, it's not something I know as much about, but I do know that the Nazis, uh, like the fascists down in Italy, were uh, in, in trying to say that we are a progressive force. We're trying to create a new Germany, or we are trying to create a new Italy, that we do not simply want to say, you know, uh, we don't like modernity and we want to go back to the good old days and have an old fashioned kind of German feudalism or Italian feudalism or, or whatever. So in that sense, they are forward looking. But at the same time, they are recognizing that uh, uh, the way the human mind works, and this is their brilliance as psychologists uh, and as propagandists, is that only a few people are able to think in terms of abstract philosophical ideas and principles, that those things need to be packaged in a way that is uh, that speaks not only to people's minds, but that speaks to their minds at a level of concreteness that they can understand and thrill to. So uh, if we look at the history of Christianity, for example, we don't do Christianity, uh, or Christians don't do Christianity simply by having a bunch of smart theologians sit around and debate the meaning of the Trinity and try to convince people intellectually of the truth of the Trinity. Instead, the Catholic Church concretizes that in all sorts of rit rituals and symbols, and they... Uh, you know, they made the compromise in the late Middle Ages to incorporate music and architecture. And the idea here is that we want to use things that can appeal to, from their perspective, largely illiterate peasants and, and people who don't have a lot of time to think, but nonetheless can grasp the message and internalize it and, and respond both intellectually and emotionally at a certain level. So the Nazis are willing to appropriate Christian themes but they are also uh, uh, willing to appropriate ethnic themes. So there are many Germans they know who want to, to know something about German history, and they want to say, you know, we used to be something pretty great. You know, we uh, we, we stood up to the Romans pretty well, right? Uh, they never conquered us, and we, in fact, uh, did some successful raids and invasions on them. 
Uh, and so there was this time when in German history, you can look back and say the German tribes or the various German um, um, uh, uh, clans and cultures and so forth were amazing. And then we went into a decline phase and we've not been so special. And to the extent that we take our ethnic identity seriously, that wounds our pride. So uh, we're interested then in looking for historical sources for the original German greatness uh, so that we can boost our ethnic pride, but at the same time appropriate and use those symbols from that time to concretize our political agenda. Now, when we are then in Northern Europe, uh, 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 the, the blending between what we now think of as the Scandinavian nations and the Slavic nations and the Germanic nations and so forth, uh, there's a lot of interchange and back and forth all over the place. I'm sorry. Uh, at that point, so, uh, so the Norse gods, as we now think of them, were pretty widespread. Uh, and so uh, to the extent they think that there is overlap with old German, and we can make the case and say this is partly what made Germany great back in the, in, in the old days. They had strong, powerful, deep gods. Uh, uh, then we can use that for our contemporary propaganda purposes. So they are using anything that they can for different subgroups inside the German population. We've got a message that appeals to the intellectuals. We have a message that appeals to the Christians. We have a message that appeals to the people who take seriously old German history. And so we're putting together coalitions and each has its packaging uh, of propaganda that's going to make them support us. Right. Now, I, I do know that um, after Nietzsche died, um, his sister who has been caring for him in the in his final years when he had his mental breakdown, um, <clears throat> she submitted the writings of Nietzsche to the Nazi authorities and she edited it and in a way that would fit their political program. So a case can be made that well, Nietzsche's sister uh, distorted the teachings of Nietzsche and that uh, if we were to look at the original teachings of Nietzsche, uh, well, um, there you wouldn't find much uh, that would be appealing to Nazism. So how would you answer to this? Um, Objection. Yeah, I have, a, I have a podcast on this in my uh, open college podcast series, and I I think that that thesis is uh, let, me, let me do some pretend philosophy math, and I'd say it's about ninety nine percent false. So, so I think the more like the the opposite is true. Now, the part of it that is true is that once Nietzsche lost control of his faculties. He uh, uh, was looked after by his sister, and she became, after he died, his literary executor. And it's also true that uh, Nietzsche, Nietzsche left behind an unpublished manuscript that we now call The Will to Power, and that uh, uh, she arranged to have it published. Now, that's, I think, as far as the, no, no, there's one other part of what you're saying that is true, that uh, she was sympathetic to the Nazis. Uh, she was a bit of a social climber as well. And so she did promote Nietzsche's views and she did promote his views to the Nazis. Now, the rest though, I think is, uh, is, is false. And let me say a few things about that. So if we take the text that we now think of the will to power, the, there was an early edition that was published. Uh, I want to say 1905 or so. Don't don't quote me on quote me on that. And she was the editor in chief. But the editor was Paul Ray, who was a highly intellectual man who had known Nietzsche for years and very carefully went through Nietzsche's unpublished manuscript to prepare it for publication. So it was not the sister who was the editor. It was Paul Ray. So we should have a direct, and he is a, a serious editor and a serious, smart guy. Now, he also, that they did not publish everything because the will to power as it's currently published in its full form is massive. It was something like a thousand aphorisms, some of them quite lengthy. So it's a, it's a big, so it was a shortened version. So there was some selectivity. We're going to include this and we're not going to include these other things. So maybe two thirds of it got published. 
And now we start adding the buts. And the buts are that every word that was published was written by Nietzsche. Every aphorism that was included was written by Nietzsche. And there are no like elisions where you start one sentence and then you drop the end of the sentence and then you pick up somewhere else uh, to put things together that do not belong together. There's none of that that goes on. The editing is, is, uh, is, is, is solid on, uh, on that score. So the most you can say is that they published a, an edited version or part of what Nietzsche published or wanted to publish. Now this also, uh, we can say, what is the status of this in Nietzsche's thinking? Because he was working actively on it up until he lost control of his faculty. So he had written everything, all four books uh, that are now the will, will to power. And what he had been working on was reorganizing it. So he had tried, you know, I'm going to you know, make part book, what I'm now calling book one, book three. I think these should go the other way around. Or I'm going to take this and move it over here. And he was unsatisfied uh, with the, the different arrangements and was still acting upon that. But everything was complete. He wasn't going to add anything more to it. He wasn't going to cut anything from it. And everything was written in his words. The other thing I would say is that every uh, um, thing that is in the will to power, uh, you can look to see if there's anything new in the will to power that was not in Nietzsche's earlier already published works. And so it's important that Nietzsche had been publishing in the 1870s, uh, Birth of Tragedy, and then Human, All Too Human, uh, The Joyous Science, Beyond Good and Evil, Thus Spake Zarathustra, Genealogy of Morals, The Antichrist, Twilight of the Idols, and so on. So there's this huge corpus of Nietzschean work and everybody who had read Nietzsche and smart people who know what Nietzsche stands for can say, this is what Nietzsche actually wrote. This is what he actually needs. So uh, then the question would be, is there anything in the will to power that is different? And I think that's an interesting scholarly question. And I think there are some things that are slightly different and perhaps uh, you know, significantly different worth thinking about. Uh, uh, and I've got a, an almost done podcast on, on this topic as well. But uh, everything that's in the will to power, you can find it in Nietzsche's earlier works. And in some cases, what it is, is that he's building on things that he has already published, expanding on or making uh, more connections between two things that he has already written. So um, to the extent that you read the will to power and the Nazi intellectuals read the will to power, I think as a good scholar, you have to say, you know, Nietzsche did not officially publish this. He didn't do, do the final sign off, but he did write every word here. So you do have to treat it as kind of one step down from having the official status of something that was officially published. But nonetheless, I think it, uh, uh, with proper scholarly treatment, uh, teaches us a lot about what Nietzsche was in fact thinking uh, late in his career, and to the extent that there are things that differ from what the Nazis say, or, or what the Nazis believed, and I think there are such things in Nietzsche, uh, that should be recognized, but also, and this is the hard thing, uh, that I think the, the people who are pushing the, the Nietzsche's sister myth, maybe myth is a bit strong uh, here, but pushing the Nietzsche's sister myth are those people who like Nietzsche, but they don't like the connection to the Nazis, so they're acting in a little bit of bad faith in trying to uh, to say uh, to deny that in fact, when the Nazi intellectuals were reading Nietzsche and saying we think Nietzsche is one of our intellectual ancestors, that they were right on many many of the points that they're drawing from Nietzsche. Okay. So finally, um, knowing all this, how should we read Friedrich Nietzsche? How should we read Friedrich Nietzsche? Yeah. Well, <clears throat> yeah, that's a that's a great question. One of the things that's interesting about Nietzsche is goes back to your original question about why he's so influential, is the fact that uh, people from so many different philosophical persuasions find him uh, a thrilling read and find that they learn from him. Sometimes it's a matter of learning new things. Sometimes it's a matter of learning that they need to have better arguments to defend their own positions. 
but uh, people who are atheist as well as theist, uh, love Nietzsche, people who are uh, uh, pro-Nazi and anti-Nazi, <laughs> love reading Nietzsche on basically any philosophical position. There's something thrilling to uh, to read in Nietzsche. And I think also uh, for the stylistic point that you, you pointed out as well, um, I think philosophers can profit from reading philosophers, not only because they are brilliant and talking about fundamental issues, but can in fact uh, be a demonstration of how to do good philosophy in a way that is rhetorically interesting and uh, and even exciting. So read philosophy, Nietzsche that way. What I would say though is uh, that if you're going to read Nietzsche though, you do have to read Nietzsche in a good philosophical spirit. You do have to be willing to say, I've got my beliefs and I'm going to go in and I know that my beliefs are going to be challenged and uh, they're going to be challenged fundamentally. Uh, this is, I think, what Nietzsche meant by his famous phrase that he philosophizes with a hammer. And that the kind of hammer he has in mind is a, a piano hammer, a tuning fork. The way uh, someone who's tuning a piano it will press the, the key and press and then will tap on the strings with this little hammer to see if it's ringing true or not. But the, the philosophy hammer is going to, so to speak, be operating on your soul and on your mind. And uh, that what he wants you to do is read him, but also attend to what goes on inside yourself when you find yourself either being repulsed or thrilled or challenged or exulting in respect to something. So you're learning about Nietzsche, but you're also going to learn a huge amount about yourself. So Nietzsche is one of the very few philosophers of the first rank who is combining doing philosophy with doing deep psychology. And that it's a, not only an exercise of trying to figure out how does the world out there work, but who am I? And uh, you have to be willing to go deep inside yourself if you're going to uh, take Nietzsche seriously uh, uh, and, and profit from it. Uh, yes, I can personally attest in my experience of reading Nietzsche uh, that I'm never bored by him. I'm always excited, <laughs> challenged, even repulsed by uh, his writings, but I'm never bored. Yeah, well said. Uh, on that note, thank you very much, Stephen Hicks, for joining the show. All right. Excellent questions. I appreciate the uh, the opportunity to talk with you.